Chapter 10. Conversion from Crime to Christ Having worked through and experienced many things, I often thought about life and its meaning. I could recall the emptiness, the absolute emptiness of my soul after going out for the evening and coming home at night. All was empty, and what was the point of it all? I was seeking an answer to life, the universe and everything. The following is an account taken from memory and notes made of my experience of conversion to Jesus Christ on Friday the 16th of January 1970. Towards the end of 1969, I was continuing my studies at Luton College, learning radio and television servicings. We would often engage in discussion, and it was easy to divert the lecturer onto subjects like spiritualism and the like. We would discuss what we would do if another world war came. We would talk about a fu the future, as portrayed by Nostradamus, drugs and other experiences. At that time, I was informed of a new film called Easy Rider and wanted to go and see it. On one occasion, I obtained some hash mixed with the opium and smoked this during the break time. This was very effectual. I made use of the sick room at college to sleep and enjoy the illusory effects of this drug, which amused my student friends. On another occasion, in January 1970, I had obtained four tablets of LSD from Peter Cohenhall, a student friend of from Bedford. He was one of my fellow students at Luton College, and I decided to take them the following Friday night, the 16th of January 1970. On this Friday night, Michael and I decided to take half a tablet each, and Pat Jones had a quarter. He had been a close friend of mine. He was only just 16 years old and I used to think of him as my apprentice. I taught him all my bad ways. There was little we did not do together. I had known him whilst he was at school, and encouraged him in crime, sniffing chloroform, smoking marijuana, hashish, weed, etc., drunkenness, violence, and permissive sex. He was known amongst our friends as Patrick Bones, or Bones. My brother was going out that night with his girlfriend, Karen Mead, so Pat Jones and I decided to walk uptown and not risk driving. We did not know the effect this drug would have on us. I was dressed in my old clothes deliberately, for I didn't know what might happen to us. We tried to thumb a lift, but eventually caught a bus and got off at the bottom of the high street. As we walked past the pictures, I noticed the film Easy Rider was being shown, so we decided to go and see it. We wanted to take someone else with us, someone who was in their right state of mind. So we went up the billiard hall and found Bernie Gilbert and Mick Ellis, but they said they would only come with us to watch the film if they could have some acid too. I decided this was okay, and so we got a taxi back to my home to get the rest of the acid. Bernie had half a tablet, Mick Ellis had the other quarter, so all four of us were about to trip on acid whilst watching the film Easy Rider. We arrived back at the pictures at about 8.45, and I fumbled a bit with my ticket as the acid had begun to take effect. Bernie and Mick suggested we go out and sit in the balcony, but I thought to myself, what if we decide to jump off? I was tripping now, and just followed them up the stairs. We sat, two in front, two behind, but Mick and Bernie's trip hadn't begun yet, as they acted and spoke normally. I did not realise how tripped I was until the film had finished. In fact, the film records Peter Fonda and his friend Dennis Hopper actually on an LSD trip. During that film, the acid had begun to take an effect and took me on a very pleasant trip in time with the music. It was almost as if the film crew had deliberately filmed the film for me. They seemed to know how to get the correct lighting and sound. However, Bernie and Mick Ellis seemed to jump about all over the place and it was irritating. I still was sitting there in my seat when all the people had gone, before I decided there was nothing more to do. So we decided to up and go, but Mick and Bernie were annoying me because they were just mucking about. All my thoughts and feelings began to reverberate four times over, and thought patterns were being reflected, and at the same time building up and snowballing. We walked out the side of the cinema, and I said to the boys, Man, you're all in the wrong scene, you can't be turned on. Then I heard Mick and Bernie say, he's turned into a wizard, that's a hippie. And there was a club room for wizards like me, that's the Dark Landing, the pub in Aylesbury. I then began a downward trip, which ended in the horrors. I began to feel paranoid, thinking, 
they were feeling sorry for me and they were being polite, hiding their feelings from me. As we went further up the road, Mick Ellis asked if I wanted a scrap with some blokes across the street. It was as though he was testing me out to see if I was the same person he knew. I said, no, I didn't. I thought they had thought I'd gone mad and they wanted to test me out. They went further up the high street and Bernie began to mess about and pull faces at me and make noises. I hid in the shop doorway and told him to stop it and Pat Jones pulled Bernie away saying, no, you don't understand, you don't understand. My horror began when I could not face the thought that they thought I'd cracked up and gone mad. This feeling was too much for me to bear. More was to come. We decided to go to the Crown Pub in Aylesbury and Brian Sale came up to me as we went there and spoke, but I was out of my mind by now, with this feeling of paranoia, I couldn't speak sensibly, and came out with a load of nonsense when I tried to speak, so I had to say quickly I was drunk, because he, I don't think he would have understood at all. I then saw Michael sitting with his girlfriend, and I went up to him and told him what was happening. He laughed and motioned to wind me up like a clockwork toy, and then my mind began to so distort so much, I had to run out the pub to get away. Pat Jones followed me, and I kept thinking the others were following us too. I kept looking back, as they didn't want them to follow me, as they annoyed me. We left the crown and walked towards Mount Street via Rickford's Hill and along Friarage Road. On the way down, it seemed like the scenery from a picture book, like Alice in Wonderland, with all the street lamps lit up. The torment of my mind began to grow so much that I couldn't bear the pain. But I couldn't get rid of it. The torment... Ken and Grace Knight lived at Mount Street. We went down there with no real aim, and as I arrived just outside the house, Jock McCallion, another friend of mine, was there, was about to leave and drive off. I jumped in beside him and told him my situation, telling him I was tripped out of my mind, and I was thinking he would offer to take me home. As I was about to ask him, he said, Dave, you're a worried man. I knew this, and now thought so did everyone else. And being told this didn't help me at all. My mind was about to blow, so I had to run again, jumped out of the car and into 24 Mount Street where Ken and Grace were. I wanted to escape and so I told them my plight, but could not explain to them what was happening to me. Grace Knight recalled she thought I was in serious trouble and began to question me, but this didn't help, so I had to say forcefully, I must have peace. So they took me out to the summer house to lie down in peace. No one seemed to understand the torment of mine I was in, and no one could help me at all. I told Mrs. Knight to leave me alone, to work it out on my own, and let me lie down. Then the torment got worse. I knew it was only the LSD doing it, but I couldn't do anything about it. I would have to wait till it had taken its course. I thought it could be twelve hours or so. But to me, each moment seemed like an eternity of torment. I couldn't endure this any more. I lay down and tried to set on my mind by thinking of good thoughts and different things, but my mind would not be controlled. The thought came, I may be driven to kill myself to get rid of the pain. I was horrified at the thought of this, and I tried to stop thinking like it, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought. I looked around to see if there was any glass or a mirror in the room, just in case, to get rid of it, just in case I might cut my wrist or throat. I just didn't know what to do. I was at the end of myself. In this condition, it was evident I couldn't help myself. My friend hadn't been able to help. My brother hadn't helped. Mr. and Mrs. Knight couldn't help. And I couldn't help myself. In this desperation, it came to me to call out to God for help. So I cried out and called on the Lord's name, saying, Jesus, please help me. At that moment, my mind went blank, and his name appeared in the imagination of my mind, but the torment soon came back again. I called out again, and his name appeared twice, and the happenings repeated. I called four times in all, and his name appeared four times, and formed a square in complete emptiness. I then began to feel emotional, and wept, but I didn't know why, and then at the moment Mrs. Knight came to the chalet door to see if she could help. It was then, at that, a flood of guilt came over me. I was convinced of the sin of adultery. I didn't know what to do. I beckoned to Mrs. Knight to come in and I said to her, did she realise how bad I was and what I'd done? I asked her to tell me the way. What could I do? 
Mrs. Knight had spoken to me about Christian things, and somehow knew she knew the way. Mrs. Knight sat down and quoted the scripture, saying, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have a lasting life. That's John 3, verse 16. After this, Jesus spoke to me. I heard his voice as clearly as I write in this and said, Dave, I'm with you. You've been searching for a long time. This is what our Father says. What you've been going through is nothing compared to what is like. I replied with thanksgiving, saying, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mrs. Knight thought I was speaking to her, but she did not know what was going on. It seemed that the words that Mrs. Knight had spoken to me were in fact were in fact the pathway to my escape. It appeared as though I was at the bottom of a pyramid and the words were the way to the top, as if I were to follow those words, then I would escape. I replied, thank you, Jesus, thank you. I then thought about hell, and my thoughts were about Pat Jones, Bernie Gilbert, Mick Ellis, and I said, well, what about the others? And Jesus said again to me, all I could do was tell them. I replied, feeling it was an impossible thing to do to convince them, but... What more could I do? I was feeling the agony of the LSD horrors and knew I wanted to warn my friends of hell to come. I reasoned within myself. They will think I've gone mad on LSD. How could I convince them? I wanted to do more than tell them. I asked, what more could I do? In order to answer my question, the Lord took me back in time to show me that all I could do was tell them. A number of weeks earlier, I had reason to read from the curses that were written and came upon the children of Israel in Deuteronomy. It says, If they forsook their God, Deuteronomy 28, verse 53, thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body. I knew nothing about the background of these things. I thought it was saying people would be so hungry and having no food to eat, a woman would be driven to eat her own afterbirth. Which, of course, was shocking. With this in mind, these weeks earlier, I tried to shock a girl at work. I was working for Radio Rentals as a colour TV engineer and said to this receptionist, how would she like to be so hungry to have to eat her own afterbirth? She responded with expected repulsion and said, how could you say such a thing? I simply said, I hadn't said it, but God has. This thing repulsed her and she did not want to know anything about the incident. Jesus took me and asked me, what did this girl do when I spoke to her? My answer was, she shut her ears as she did not want to know. It was repulsive to her. His reply was to me that if I tell people about hell and what I had learned, and they screw their faces up and don't want to know, I could do no more. The condition of the person listening is not my responsibility, but theirs. All I could do was tell them, so tell them I would. To these questions, Mrs. Knight thought I was asking her because I was speaking aloud. But before she could answer, I'd already been given the answer directly from the Lord. When Jesus stopped speaking to me, I felt as though I was falling back into my torment, and I prayed again, please don't leave me. His reply was, I'll never leave you. Jesus then questioned me and asked me, he said, why boast? That is because it was a natural thing for me to boast among my friends, just to make a good impression. I reasoned within myself now, and now knew I had no need to boast of anything. So from that day, I've always avoided boasting. My torment ceased from that time, and the rest of that night passed with various thoughts going through my mind. Mrs. Knight was not fully aware of what was taking place, the next day was Saturday, and I was due to go to work, but I decided to take the day off. I phoned into work, briefly saying I was not going to work. 